And we're walking through John's gospel. He highlights seven sign miracles. And they all point to Jesus. We went to a wedding. He turned water to wine. He healed a boy. A father's son was sick. 18 miles away, the Lord of the distance. He healed that child. Last week, we were at the pool of Bethesda. Pastor Rick taught God's word about a man, 38 years, could not walk. Jesus healed him. We've come now to the fourth sign miracle, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. And it's in John chapter 6, and we're going to read that together. Now, before we read this together, I feel a, I feel a real strong leading of the Lord to, to just say what I'm about to say. You know, many people come every week to Christ's place, and they're at different places spiritually. Many are believers. Many are walking with the Lord. Some that come, they don't know the Lord yet. But you're attending, you're listening, you're taking notes, you're hearing God's word proclaimed. This could be the Sunday that you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. At the end of this service, I'll be baptizing a few folks. And I just want to say this. If there's someone in this room and God has been dealing with you, has been stirring in your heart, and you need to take a step in obedience to the Lord, you need to become a follower of Jesus, you need to be baptized Perhaps this wasn't even on your mind today, but at the end of this service, if you want to obey the Lord and commit your life to Christ and let others know you're not ashamed of Jesus, it would be an honor to baptize you today. Perhaps you have not come prepared. It's okay because we'll be ready for you and you can have the most wonderful moment of your life to walk in obedience to the Lord. So I want to just pray now. I want to just pray before we read the scripture that if God is dealing with someone, that this will be the day that when I get done with the message today, that you will go all out and declare your faith in Jesus Christ. May we pray together. God, thank you for worship. Thank you for the word. Use your word today to draw us close to you. And if there is someone today that needs to begin a relationship with Jesus, if there are if there is someone today, maybe a married couple, maybe an entire family, and they want to obey the Lord and publicly be baptized to say they're not ashamed of Jesus, I'm praying for divine surprises today that you'll do something that is miraculous. And we'll praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, we make this prayer. Amen. So we're in John 6, and I want to begin reading in verse 1 through verse 15. Do you have a Bible? Look at God's Word. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand, lifting up his eyes then seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, one of the disciples, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Jesus said this to test Philip, for Jesus himself knew what he would do. Philip answered 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing be wasted or lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 
baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving them that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, I don't know if you're new to church, but probably all of us have heard the miraculous story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. He actually fed more than 5,000. There were 5,000 men, but when you read the other gospels, it fills in the blanks. There were women and children there, so the crowd could have been anywhere between 15 to 20,000. This is the only miracle in the Bible that the Lord put in the gospels four times. Now, we know the resurrection is the greatest miracle, but this is the only miracle that Jesus performed, and it's in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all talk about the same miracle. Why did God do that? I think God wanted this miracle repeated four times for a reason. I think it's the heart of God, and I think he wants to get this miracle into your heart and to show you that this miracle is more than about food, it's about life in Christ. All the miracles were about having a life relationship with Jesus. I mean, the entire purpose of John was this in John 20 and 31, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The miracle is in our Bible today because God wants you to see that your greatest need is Jesus Christ. So this is what the miracle is about today. You could call it our sermon in a sentence. Jesus is the answer. And only Jesus can meet our deepest need. So whatever is wrong with your life today, I don't want to oversimplify this, but Jesus is the answer and only Jesus Christ can meet the deepest need of every single person here today. Now, we often think this is a miracle about food, and we love food, right? Do you like food? Some of us think about food all the time. As one preacher said, you're thinking more about beef roast than the Holy Ghost, you know? And so some of us, you know, I, now on average, uh, we eat 1,100 times a year. Some of you fly right past that number. You know, you're way higher than that. But if you do three meals a day for the whole year, it's about 1,100 times. So we like to eat. You know, you live to eat, you eat to live. And some of us, we just like food. And I'll tell you, uh, commercials real, uh, draw you in, don't they? They're so attractive. Or maybe a billboard on the interstate. Uh, and you'll see this sign. Let me show you a picture of something that looks tantalizing. A hamburger. I love hamburgers. And so let's say you're driving down the interstate and you're not even hungry, but when you see this sign, you become hungry. I mean, that juicy patty and that cheese that is just like perfectly symmetrically melted on that all beef patty. And I ain't even talking about the lettuce and the tomato and the onion. And there's just dew dripping off them. And then peaking from that bun is ketchup and mustard and mayo and that bun. I'm telling you, as you pass by that billboard, it even looks fresh. So you're like, well, where is this exit? And you go in there and you go through the drive-in and you're so excited about that burger you saw on a sign. And when you open the bag, this is what you see. <laughs> and then you say to the sweet lady at the window, please give my compliments to the photographer, please. Because what was in the bag did not look like what was on the sign. And you know, they have their tricks of doing this. I, I've learned a ton in preparing this lesson today. I, I learned that there are food photo hacks and you can do certain things to make food look good. So I'll show you a couple of things that we like. We all like pizza, right? Pizza is God's food. Pizza is anointed by the Lord. We're gonna eat pizza in heaven, right? So we see these advertisement for pizza and man, it's piping hot and you're pulling that slice out. Now, you know how they make that look good? 
let me show you what they used in that picture. They use glue. They use glue to make it sticky. How many out there, you are a uh, cereal eater? You love to eat cereal. And man, you see that advertisement and you see cereal and fruit and not that healthy milk, that good milk that just makes your fat gram sing the hallelujah chorus. You know, that whole milk. And so you know how they make that look good, don't you? That is Elmer's school glue that they're putting in that bowl and they just want you to think that's white milk. It's actually glue that the cereal grows. And then maybe, maybe some of you like pumpkin pie. Can I get a witness in the church house? Pumpkin pie. I can eat it any month. And so you see that pumpkin pie like your grandmother would make and that big old piece of whipped cream on the top. That ain't whipped cream. That's your papaw shaving cream. That's what that is. Did you know that? Yeah. I'm robbing your appetite today, aren't I? How about you breakfast people? You know, I, I eat breakfast out of necessity. Becky, it's pleasure for her. She loves breakfast when we travel and go on vacations, things like that. So you see these pancakes and you see that syrup on those pancakes. That ain't syrup. You know what that is? That is motor oil. So I thought I'd just fire you up today. I, I've helped all y'all lose about 10 pounds. You're going to be ready to get in your swimsuit, all right? Do you know that's how the devil works? The devil uses signs as well. And he shows you pictures. He shows you signs. He tells you that you have to have this. You have to be this. Your body has to look a certain way. You have to drive a certain automobile. You have to have a certain college that you go to. You have to wear certain clothes. You have to achieve this, do that, get there. And then that will fulfill what you're looking for. And that's a lie. That's a deceptive trick of the devil. Because see, our greatest need is Christ. And that's what this miracle is talking about, that what we need is Christ who is the bread of life. John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the miracle is more than food. I'll tell you something else about this miracle we're looking at today. It could not come at a better time because right now in America, in Georgia, wherever you live, in the United States, in the world, all we hear is inflation, inflation. Your earnings now might reflect your earnings two or three years ago. Gas prices have bumped back up. Are there any young families today and you've got babies on formula and you hear about this baby formula shortage, this panic buying, and all we hear is this distressing, depressing, despairing news. We're going to run out of things. How we need John 6 today. Because what we're going to learn today is God is our source, not the government. That God is your supplier, not your employer. And we're going to learn that whatever we put in the hands of the Lord and trust him, he will always meet our needs. He did not promise to meet our greeds, but he will meet our needs. So we're going to walk through the Gospel of John. I hope your Bible's open. And I want to talk to you about a few things that we need to see in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. What we need to see to begin with is the setting of the miracle. We all know the miracle, but you probably don't know a little of the background. So I want to talk to you about the setting of the miracle, the context of this miracle. Look at verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. See the phrase, after this. So it is connecting this miracle to the miracle Pastor Rick taught us last week when the man was healed at the pool of Bethesda. How long ago did Jesus do that miracle? Six months. Now, I know it was a week ago we studied it, but in real time, as John is writing here about these events, six months earlier, Jesus did that miracle. And now John is telling us even the time of the year, it's around March or April, around Passover. He says this miracle happened by a body of water. It's called the Sea of Galilee. It's also called the Sea of Tiberias. 
So you can go and see the Sea of Galilee if you were to go to Israel. We got a trip, by the way, a little plug here. Next year, we're going to Israel. I'd love for you to go with me March 20th to the 29th. We're going to tour the Holy Land. And so if you're interested, contact my office and uh, Jen and Julie can get you some uh, information. We're actually going to be on the Sea of Galilee. We stop the boat. I preach a sermon. Normally, whoever's with me on the trip, we throw them out of the boat to see if they can walk on the water. Just joking. But we'll actually be there where this happened, where this miracle took place in that vicinity. So look at verse 2. And a large crowd was following Jesus because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. There's a phrase I want you to highlight on here, large crowd. The crowd was insane. It was so big. So it was this massive group of people, and they were following Jesus for the wrong reason. They were following for miracles, signs, food. They were not following him to be their savior. And his popularity was so great, Jesus could never have private time, nor could his disciples. So don't ever wish to be famous. You may get that wish. Famous people, they are not living the dream. I mean, you've got the paparazzi following you all the time, and Jesus had the paparazzi following him all the time. Jesus and his disciples were being people to death. They had no solitude, no time to even eat a meal in private. Some may not know this, but they also were very sad in this moment. Any sad people in the room today? Jesus and his disciples were very sad in this moment. Let me tell you why. Jesus, his cousin, was murdered. His cousin was murdered. His cousin's name was John the Baptist, and he just received news that John was decapitated. John was murdered by the king. And Jesus and the disciples love John, and they are, they're hurting. We've had a lot of funerals at Christ's place in recent days. We've had a lot of sadness and grief and bereavement. And what I notice is if you're going through that, it can wear you down. It can emotionally drain you and you just need sleep and you need food and you need rest. So here is the setting. He just got word that his cousin was beheaded and they just needed some time alone. And so John tells us in verse two that uh, they are being hounded by people and they need a break. Verse three, Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. So he's with his crowd right now. He's with his tribe and they're just resting a little bit. They're, they're catnapping. They're eating some food. They are discouraged about John's murder and they couldn't even eat. This is what Mark said in Mark 6. The disciples returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let us go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because they were there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. Have you ever been that busy? I was reading this quote on social media a few days ago that May is the new December. You know how December is like so stinking busy? Now it's May. You got graduations, you know, tests, schools coming to an end, different family events, weddings, things like that. And so Jesus said, we've got to get away so we can eat together and rest a little bit. Here's the message for us. If you are living a busy life, it's going to result in a barren life. Eventually, your well is going to run dry. If you're never just taking time for you and Jesus to spend time together in his word and listening to him, you're going to wear yourself down. If you keep burning the candles at both ends, you're going to have to pay the price. So here's a great word for us as we get ready for summer at Christ's place and things that we'll be doing. Make sure that every day you're spending time with the Lord because when you do, it refuels you. It recharges you. Keep doing those here journals. Keep spending time with the Lord because that's what's gonna give you strength for whatever is waiting in the future for you. The Bible says in verse four that it was Passover. Look at that. Now the Passover, the Feast of Jews was at hand. So that's why we know that there were green grass that we're gonna look at in a moment. They sat on green grass and explains that because it's spring. Also it explains the boatload of people that because Passover would bring people in like crazy to Jerusalem. 
Passover was a, was a Jewish holiday for God's people and, and it made them look back to the liberation that Moses gave, that God gave through Moses. They no longer were slaves, they left Egypt. And so at this time of Passover, it, it made the political temperatures run high that they were looking for someone to liberate them from the tyranny of Rome. And that explains verse 15 when they wanted to make Jesus king by force. So that's the setting of the miracle. Let me show you something else. I want to show you now the conversations that begin to take place. So in verses five and nine, we get to hear Jesus talk privately to his disciples. It's almost like you being at a Georgia football game and you're way up there in the stands and you got some binoculars and you're watching coach Kirby Smart talk to one of the players and you're wondering, I wonder what he's saying to him. When he threw the hat on the ground, I think I know what he said to him. So you're, you're being able to hear the conversations that Jesus is having with two particular disciples. Look at verse five. Lifting up his eyes and then seeing the crowd that was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so these people may eat? So Matthew and Mark and Luke say to us that Jesus taught the people and he did some miracles and the sun was setting. The day was worn out. And so it was the end of the day and the people needed to eat. So what did the disciples say to Jesus? Tell these people to go home. They really had the spiritual gift of mercy, right? Lord, tell them to go home so we can go back and eat. But Jesus had compassion. They were following Jesus for the wrong reasons, but he loved them. Maybe you're here for the wrong reason. Can I tell you something? The Lord flat loves you. Maybe you pray for the wrong reason. Maybe you look at your Bible for the wrong reason. But God is chasing you. God is searching after you. That's why I mentioned baptism and in this service. It wouldn't surprise me that someone in this room, God is dealing with you in a way that is so powerful that you are just so ready right now to say, God, I'm all in for you. But this crowd, at this moment, they were looking for what they could get out of Jesus. And they didn't see their need for Christ. But the Lord didn't rebuke them. He loved them. So he said to Philip, where are we gonna get bread to feed all these 15, 20,000 people? Why did he ask Philip? I've always wondered that. Why did the Lord ask Philip? Well, I got, a, got an idea. Philip was from there. He was a local yokel. So you know, when you, when you wanna know someone to work on your car, you wanna know a good restaurant, yes, someone that lives in the community, right? Philip was from this vicinity. But there's another reason, and here's the big reason that Jesus asked Philip that question. Look at verse six. He said this to Philip to test him, for the Lord already knew what he would do. So the Lord has given Philip a test now, the Lord doesn't test me and you so that we will help the Lord understand. He already knows what to do. The test is to reveal what's in our heart. Anytime God puts a test in front of you, it is always for the purpose of revealing something in your heart. So what did God want to see in Philip from this test? He wanted to see, number one, did Philip have confidence in Jesus as the Son of God who could do anything? He also wanted to see if Philip cared about people. And we're going to find out that Philip did not do very well on this test. Look at verse 7. He said, Lord, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. How much is 200 denarii? How about about eight months of working wages? How about this in our dollars? About $17,000. Now, that was uh, pre-inflation, I'm sure. And so here's Philip, you know, he's just rattling off a bunch of statistics to Jesus. It's crazy. He is standing beside Jesus, who is God in human flesh, who flung the stars into the space, who scooped up the oceans, who formed the mountains, and he is rattling off a bunch of statistics about what to do, and he didn't realize who was standing beside him. Do you ever lose sight of Jesus like that in your life, your marriage, your finances? And so Philip, he, he is calculating. He knew math, but didn't have faith. He knew dollars and cents, but didn't have spiritual sense. And he is doing all this figuring. And there's always a Philip. There's always a Phyllis among us. 
You know, we always are pulling out our phone and looking at that calculator. We're always writing things down on paper. And we ought to be good planners and we ought to be good stewards, but never calculate God out of your situation. His brain's in overdrive. How much would all this cost? How will we transport the food? How will we keep the food warm? All these people, we need a bunch of porta potties too. And then we got cleanup and then, and then listen, you got liability insurance because today people will sue your face off. And so, you know, he, he's just, he's quite pessimistic. And then he actually said, you know, even if you had, you know, $17,000 to take care of these people, all they're going to get is a little bit. All they're going to get is like, you know, one fried pickle to dip in ranch sauce. Can I get a witness today? That's about all they're going to get is just one little pickle. They're not going to get a lot. They're just going to get a little. So he's so pessimistic. He's not thinking miraculous. He's thinking minimum requirement and how often we do the same. Are you doing that right now with your life? Are you doing that right now with your vocation, your finances, your faith walk? Philip needed this test because anytime God will test me and test you, it's going to reveal what's already in our heart. And the Lord already taught his disciples to pray. In Matthew 6, 11, he said, pray like this. Give us this day our, yeah, you know it, class, you know it. He already taught them to pray that way, that Lord, you're going to supply my daily bread. And it seems like Philip has spiritual amnesia in this moment. And the Lord is going to teach him. How often the Lord has to teach me and reteach me. How often I need to relearn things that I already know. How often God is always moving me in steps. That's, that's the right place to be as a follower of Christ. You're always taking steps. Don't go backwards. Stay away from sideways energy. Take baby steps. The Lord's always pushing you forward. It's hard, but you're going to learn to trust God. We grow through trust. We grow in faith. And God is stretching Philip and God is getting him in the faith realm, not the humanistic realm. God wanted to remind Philip, Jeremiah 32, 27, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Let's answer that question right now. Is there anything too hard for God? The answer is, okay, let's live that way. Let's not just give the church answer, but let's live out God's truth to say that we are going to trust him. Then Andrew has the conversation. Look at verse nine. There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Now, I like Andrew. He, he's always been kind of like one of my favorites of the disciples. I, I guess one thing I like about him is he was always bringing people to the Lord. I mean, he always had a fresh my five list, you know? He always had names on his my five list. And he's bringing people to Jesus. I'm very thankful that it is Andrew that found this boy with the lunch and not Judas. Judas would have ate the lunch. Don't you believe that? That sucker would have ate the lunch. But here is Andrew and he has a heart for people and he's bringing this kid to Jesus. He did something good, but he's about to, he's about to squash what he did good with his unbelief. You ever do that? You do good things. You get in the word, you pray, you honor God, but then you squash all you do because of your lack of trust and faith in God. And Andrew, his statement is inadequacy. He's like, Lord, I found this little boy with a little lunch and how can it do anything with such a large group? There's an old gospel song. Any of you gospel fans remember this song? Little is much when God is in it. Don't you ever forget that. Little is much when God is in it. Zechariah the prophet said, never despise small beginnings. And you may have something little you can do for God. You may have something little you can contribute for God. But when it is put in God's hands, it's transformed. And God can do big stuff through little faith and small acts of obedience. Now, both these men love Jesus. I'm not going to throw shade at them today. Philip lacks faith. Andrew lacks faith. Jeff lacks faith. We all lack faith. We're fellow strugglers today. And that's why the Lord is showing us today that we always need to be stretched. And we, and we grow when we trust. And we grow when we obey. So time out right now. And I'm going to look at you in your eyeballs. How is God stretching you right now? 
Mom, how is he stretching you as a mother, as a wife? Single mom, you're stretched all the time, but it's an opportunity for you to see God as your provider. High school graduate, you're being stretched. I mean, you did great in high school, but now we're, what you're about to do in that syllabus you're about to get, it's gonna stretch you. It's gonna be an opportunity for us all to learn to believe God and to trust God and how God uses small things. Jesus honored the small contribution of this little boy. I'm not gonna get into what the kid's lunch looked like. It was a poor boy's lunch, but God took a poor boy's lunch and he did something extraordinary with it. Don't you forget anything Anything you transfer to Jesus can be transformed by Jesus. Don't forget that lesson. Anything you put into his hands, remember his hands made the world. His hands, we are in his hands. He holds everything together. So what you transfer into his hands, he can do a transformational work. And so God used this kid. Moms and dads, God wants to use your kids. That's why you need to send them to student camp. I mean, if, you know, if, if, if you're not providentially hindered like a vacation or something like that, get your kid into student camp. And by the way, some of you have been given scholarships to student camp. You have blown me away with your generosity. Thank you. We are seeing so many students that would be struggling that can't go to camp because you're helping them. If you're led to do that, help us. We, we, we have room for more. But God wants to use your son, your daughter. Don't you ever think they gotta be a certain age for them to really bring honor and glory to God. Start when they're small teaching them. Start when they're small doing things as a family that you can serve the Lord together at Christ's place. Start when, they, if, when they're small and their heart is tender and you mentor them and disciple them that they, when they become an adult, they'll have a heart that's been cultivated by you, mom and dad, that you shepherd that heart. I think God makes this little kid a hero in this Bible because he wants us to rem be remindful that he uses little people to do big things for him. Jesus didn't need this kid. Think of the ways that Jesus could have fed this crowd. He could have been like Aquaman and made all the fish jump out of the Sea of Galilee right into people's hands. He could, he could have made you know the trees and the bushes around just to produce fruit instantaneously, just big luscious fruit that you just touch it and fall in your hand. He rang quail down from heaven. He gave them manna in the Old Testament. He could have done that. Listen, the Lord doesn't need me or you, but he likes to use me and you. This is what I've learned about our master. He seldom does things without us. He can, he can, he's God, but he loves to invite us in the miracle. He loves to show you his almighty power. He loves to build your faith when you pray. He loves to see you meet needs. And so he invites us to join him. Find out where the Lord is working. Step into where God is working and moving. We get to be part of what God is doing. So now let's look at the miracle that Jesus did. And it's a wow miracle. The miracle that Jesus did is in verses 10 through 13. There's a big crowd there. Look at verse 10. You're looking at verse 10. Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. Remember March, April, Passover, spring grass. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. Now listen to this reference from Mark. I want you to see this on the screen. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So when they sat down, they were in groups by hundreds and fifties. Now, I don't know, you know, I, I, one of my spiritual gifts is leading administration. I love organization. So I'm just, I'm like, I'm like liking this. I like that order, you know, I don't like chaos. So he, he has them in groups. There's a group over here of a hundred. There's a group over here of 50. They're everywhere. All this order, all this structure. It's gonna help the disciples to be ushers, you know? And so churches need good ushers, right? And so they're going to, uh, they're gonna serve these groups. I'm telling you, if I could paint, I'd wanna paint this picture. Because if I painted this picture, I want you to look at my canvas as I'm painting. Here's how I'd paint it. I'd have blue sea in the background. I'd have green grass there on the banks of the blue sea. And I'd have all those Middle Eastern people, they wear that colorful clothing and I'd have them in groups of 150. Somebody ought to paint that picture and bless me, give it to me. But anyway, uh, 
can, can you see it? Can you see that picture? So they all sit down. Something big's about to happen. And you can look at the disciples. They're like, I wonder what he's going to do. They're looking at one another. You know how you can talk with people through your body language, through your eyes? And I'm sure they're looking at one another like, the Lord is about to like mind blow. He's up, he's up to it again. He's going to do a miracle. And so Jesus performs this unbelievable miracle. Verse 11, he prayed over the meal. So before he served the people, the other gospel writer said he looked up into heaven and thanked God for what he was about to do. And then the Bible says he began to distribute the food. When did the miracle take place? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't know when it happened in the uh, wedding in Cana. I don't know when the water became wine. It just happened. I don't know when the Lord multiplied the bread and the fish. I, I want to believe as I'm studying the text and I'm teaching you the Bible today, I, I want to believe it happened in his hands. Because see, the disciples, they did not, uh, they did not reproduce all that. They were not the supply. They were part of the supply chain. They were feeding the people, but they would come to Jesus. Jesus was the one providing. He was the manufacturer. They were the distributors. So evidently it happened in his hands. So whatever you transfer to the hands of the Lord, the miraculous can take place. I'm, I'm telling you what's really helping me in this miracle that, you know, a lot of times we feel like we got to produce. We got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We got to make it happen. You know, we, we got to be the miracle workers. You can't do miracles. I can't do miracles. We are not manufacturers. We're distributors. As soon as you learn that as a dad, as a mom, as a college student, you rest in the Lord. You rest in the almighty God. You say, Lord, I can't do it. I have clay feet. I'm a struggling sinner, but I'm gonna submit to you. I'm gonna trust you. What I can't do, you're gonna do. I am weak, you are strong. We aren't manufacturers. We are simply distributors. That's why we should always live open-handed. Don't live your life like this. If you live your life with closed hands, do you know what you have? A fighting posture to God. That's your posture. But when you're open-handed, it's amazing what God can put in your hands to distribute. And so this, this, this miracle takes place. The Bible, the Bible says that everybody ate. Uh, they had leftovers in verse 12 and 13. Now, that is a no-brainer for us. We don't even think about that because we always have leftovers, right? But in this Agarian culture, they, that was unheard of. They never, they never, they never had leftovers. So to have food left over was mind-blowing. The Bible says that they ate as much as they wanted. They had their full. They had 12 baskets remaining. It sounds like to me, Golden Corral buffet time. I mean, they had, you ever been to one of those places and they're like, they help your plate. You always want to get, when you're going through that line, you always want somebody with the gift of generosity. You don't want a stingy person, right? And so, you know, they'll say, only a half a slice of pizza, only one pepperoni. No, 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 a half a pepperoni. But there was more than enough. Everybody got full. What does that say? That God is not a God that gives sparingly. He's the Lord of abundance. He meets your needs and more. Our cup runs over. And this is the miracle that God did. Now, I got a little ticked off when I was preparing this lesson. Because, you know, I read a lot so I can be prepared to teach you God's word. And I came up on this book I was reading and this person said it wasn't a miracle that happened. He said that when the crowd saw that little kid's lunch, that it kind of did something to them thinking, oh, he's just got that little lunch. So then they all pulled their lunches out and they shared. So I'm gonna tell you what I think about that. You ready? Come up here, come up close and hear this. You ready? <laughs> That's nonsense. I'm telling you, the Lord did this miracle. 15 to 20,000 people ate. There were no restaurants around. And if it was Sunday, Chick-fil-A ain't gonna help you. And there was no Wendy's in sight, no MacD's in sight. The Lord multiplied the loaves and the fish. It was the Lord that did this miracle and how God was teaching the disciples to trust him and how God used a little kid's lunch 
to feed a massive crowd. What is the response of the people in verse 14 and 15? Verse 14, when the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they said, this is the prophet. Notice it's uppercase letter P who is coming to the world. It is a reference to Deuteronomy 18. It was a reference to a second Moses. So they're like, here he is, the second Moses. And they were thinking, Moses, he led us out of the wilderness, uh, out of uh, Egypt. Moses, he led us through the wilderness. Moses, he fed us. Moses, water came out of the rock. This is our new leader. And, and what they begin to do is they tried to take Jesus by force and make him king. Every Passover, there would be this like hyped awareness. We want freedom. We want liberation. We want to flush Rome down the toilet. We want our leader. They didn't want a savior. They wanted a vending machine. They didn't want a savior. They wanted just someone to feed them. Let me tell you something. People will follow anyone for food. That's why socialism is, is, is a wreck for any nation. And communism is something that's just belched out of a hell hole. Uh, God is not against capitalism. God, God wants people to work. God wants people to earn and he wants to bless them. But, but if someone's doling out food, you'll, you'll follow anybody. You just fast forward to the book of Revelation. When we believers are out of here, people will take a mark. People will do anything to, to buy, sell, trade, get food. People will lose their minds just to eat. They'll follow anybody. So they're in this frenzy and they're like, make him king, make him king. Imagine a leader that can make food out of anything. And Jesus knew their heart. In verse 15, the Bible says, perceiving them that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, the next day he's gonna tell them the message of the miracle, but they're not ready to hear it. And sometimes we're that way, you know what? I mean, you're reading God's word, you're hearing Pastor Jeff teach, but, but your, the posture of your heart still is not there to listen. And, and the Lord knew they weren't ready to hear it. He'll tell them the next day, and he's gonna show them that their deepest need is Christ himself. So let me land, let me land our teaching today and just make a little bit of application on do you see your greatest need is Jesus. If you have a worry today, the answer is Jesus. Any worry you've come into the building with, John 6 is teaching you that the Lord is our shepherd. He'll meet our needs. He'll take care of us. And if you allow worry to creep into your heart, it's gonna rob you of your worship of Almighty God. You can't worry and worship at the same time. I've always believed this. Whatever concerns me concerns him. Whatever concerns you, mama, whatever concerns you, daddy, Whatever concerns you, high school graduate, concerns the Lord. If you have a worry, Jesus is the answer. If you have an unsolvable problem today, the answer is Jesus. They had a problem. They didn't know how they were gonna feed this crowd, but the Lord knew, the Lord knew. And whatever you put in his hands, he can solve it. You know, we're gonna have an altar call in a moment and I want you right now to be thinking about how you need to respond to our altar call. Some of us have some big problems that are complex and we're wrestling with and you know what you have an opportunity to do? You can live out John 6 by coming and get on your knees and transfer your problem into the hands of Jesus. Here's another application point that I want us to see today. If you are asking, how can I become more effective? The answer is Jesus. If you're looking at your life and you say, I'm spinning my tires, I'm wasting my days. Why am I on this planet? What is my purpose in life? If you will learn to transfer your life into the hands of Jesus, he will do more through you and in you and with you than you could ever do on your own. The answer is Jesus. And today, if you have a soul hunger, not a food hunger, but a soul hunger. These people did not need just bread. They needed the bread of life. The answer is Jesus. Jesus said to them in verse 35, John 6, 35, he said, I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Their deepest need was Christ. Their deepest need was a relationship with him. I want you to see that today and I want you to understand it today. The devil, he dangles these pictures in front of you like a juicy hamburger. And then when you open the bag, it looks sad. 
And, and the devil, he's so, he's so shrewd. He'll give, you, he'll give you candy wrapped, but it's poison when you put it into your body. You were not made for this life, nor was I. God put eternity in our heart and God wants a relationship with you today, but you must invite the bread of life into your life and he, he will satisfy you. Sex will never satisfy you. Drugs will never satisfy you. Instagram likes will never satisfy you. Work will never satisfy you. Food will never satisfy you. Having the ultimate bod, looking good. You're gonna slip one day and eat too many French fries. That will not satisfy you. Your heart was made for God and only Jesus can satisfy you. He began to teach and the Bible says in John 6, 66, listen to this scripture. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What a sad verse. Because some people walked away from Jesus for other stuff. Don't forget that verse. John 6, 6, 6. When they heard Jesus speak, they're like, I can't do it. I'm going to go to food because it medicates me. I'm going to go to drugs. I'm going to go to my pornography. I'm going to go to whatever. And it's going to leave you empty. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, you're going to leave me too? And I love Peter's answer. It's on the screen. Lord, there is no one else that we can go to. Your words have eternal life. We have faith in you. And we are sure that you are God's holy one. That's the answer. If you don't turn to Jesus, what are you going to turn to? And, and what you think is going to work for you? How's it working? How's it working for you? You know the answer. You're so empty. Come to Jesus today. Come to the bread of life. If you are a believer and you've got a worry, you've got a problem, come and put it in the hands of Jesus. Husband, be the leader today. Grab your sweet wife by the hand. You know what y'all are struggling with. It might be money. It might be raising kids. It might be whatever. Say, let's go down today and get on our knees and put it in his hands today. Maybe it's something you're struggling with. You can't let go of it. Release it. There's power in releasing. Release it and put it in the hands of Jesus. And if you're not a believer today, come to Christ. I'm going to be leaving in a second to go baptize a family I'm wondering, is there anyone in this room that God is stirring in your heart and you need to do what this family is doing today? Would you bow with me right now? We're gonna pray all over the building. You can, you can close your Bible, but don't close your heart. If there's somebody today that would like to begin a relationship with Jesus, would you pray with me right now? Pray this and believe it with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I want the bread of life in my life. I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven. And the deep hunger I have today, I need you to fill me up and satisfy me with your salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So if someone prayed with me, Pastor Grady, he's gonna come right now and stand here I'm going to slip out to baptize. If you today would like to follow Christ, you've been coming to Christ's place. You can't believe I'm saying this because you've been thinking it. Don't you know that God has brought this together? God brought me here to preach this message. God brought you to hear it. Now all you've got to do is step out and be obedient. We're all going to stand right now. Pastor Grady is here to receive anyone that wants to follow Christ and be baptized today. This altar is open for any believer that wants to put something in the hands of Jesus. Caleb and worship team, start singing. Let's, let's pray, let's praise, let's obey. Let's see God move and work.